The Story of Earth, Part 2. Part 1 of this series described the first stage of the global flood. Initial devastation, massive erosion, followed by rapid deposition of sediment, plants and animals. Part 2 will describe the third stage, which involves formation of virtually all our modern landscapes. As the water began to flow off the continents, both sheet and then channel erosion carved out the magnificent landscapes that are seen around the world. Catastrophic tectonic and volcanic forces built the large mountain ranges we see on the earth. In regard to massive erosion by water, there are two main types. The first is related to the regression of the flood waters as they moved into the ocean basins and off the continents. The second is related to large inland lakes which suddenly burst through mountain ranges that were holding them in. Some of these lakes formed as a result of melting ice which followed the ice age which was a consequence of the global flood. For example, the channeled scablands in the US formed when the glacial Lake Missoula was catastrophically emptied due to the melting of ice which had kept it in. To understand the receding stage of the flood, one must understand how the ocean basins deepened to hold the increased amount of water. The subterranean water, which was below the old ocean floor, was pushed through a tectonic rift by rising magma. Superheated, pressurised steam burst into the underlying ocean. In turn, the oceans rose to cover the whole earth. As the magma reached the ocean floor, it cooled rapidly, forming new ocean floor and spread away from the rift. This magma formed basalt, which as it cooled became denser and sank into the underlying mantle, deepening the oceans. Due to isostatic force, the relative lighter continents began to rise and the overlying water rushed towards the deeper oceans. As can be seen by the graphic, the subterranean water underneath the ocean was released by the pressure and heat from the rising magma. This magma in turn rapidly formed new ocean floors, pushing away the old ocean floor. This is in contrast to the Atlantic Ocean, which formed from the splitting of the single continent Pangaea, where only new ocean floor was formed. The initial stage of this landscape formation is characterised by sheet erosion. These formed large expanses of flat plateaus and plains which are seen all over the world. These flat plateaus, especially those ones at a high altitude, cannot adequately be explained in terms of millions of years. For over millions of years, wind, water and chemical erosion would have dramatically altered the flat plateaus into an irregular landscape. The physical evidence that these plains, often called planation surfaces, were eroded by water is demonstrated by the fact that they are capped by rounded rocks due to the action of water. They are not to be confused with surfaces which are flat due to deposition of sediment within water. The other characteristic of these surfaces is that they show no regard to the underlying rock. Whether they be hard or soft, they are all eroded down to the same flat surface. This demonstrates the immense force of a large amount of water causing sheet erosion. Intermittent erosion over millions of years would erode the soft rock in preference to the hard. Such erosion is most noticeable in Australia and Africa. The Nullarbor Plain in Australia is 200,000 kilometres squared in area and is remarkably flat. It is not a single exposed bedding plain and therefore not a structural feature. The only rational explanation is sheet erosion by water. 60% of Africa is made up of planation surfaces. The Serengeti Plain is made up of deformed igneous rock, i.e. from magma, and metamorphic rock, i.e. rock that has been altered by pressure and temperature. However, they have all been beveled off as a remarkably flat surface with no preference of erosion to the softer rock. There is no uniformitarian hypothesis that can adequately explain this as there is no geological process now observable that creates such planation surfaces. An immense volume of water began to carve out extraordinary channels through underlying elevations. An example is the Fish River Canyon in Namibia, Africa. This is also what formed the overfit valleys and water gaps in our landscapes. A majority of this sediment was then dumped onto the continental shelves underneath the oceans. A great example of this is at the Grand Canyon, 
where the floodwaters overlying Arizona, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming and New Mexico were flowing east to west. Sheet erosion ensued, devastatingly sweeping away two to three kilometres of vertical underlying sedimentary layers, eventually forming the Colorado Plateau. As the volume of water reduced and successive sedimentary layers were eroded away, the stepwise erosion formed the Grand Staircase. Such distinctive erosion is characteristic of sheet flood erosion but does not make sense following millions of years of weathering. Two major mysteries of the Grand Canyon include its amazing branching structure and the fact that it is carved into an uplifted portion of the Colorado Plateau. This is easily understood in the receding flood scenario as the water that flows over the top of an elevated area increases in speed and therefore erosive force, forming the beginnings of a channel. It is obvious that the immense overfit valley of the Grand Canyon could not have been formed by the comparatively tiny Colorado River running through it. Only an extraordinary amount of water could have carved out such a large canyon. This channel then developed amazing branching structures that are not indicative of a breach dam, another theory for the creation of the Grand Canyon, nor is it characteristic of millions of years of weathering. However, such a branching pattern is formed in the receding flood scenario through soft sediment as the waters slowed in speed. The flow of water from east to west flowed over the elevated Colorado Plateau and the escarpment on its west side. As the waters rushed over this elevated area, multiple channels were formed. As the flood waters reduced, all of the water was channeled through the largest and deepest, which became the Grand Canyon. In regard to the Grand Canyon, this erosion began in its west part, and the erosive power of the receding water carved a gully and then canyon in an upstream pattern. This type of upstream erosion is seen at Niagara Falls. Unlike Niagara Falls, However, the sediment that the receding flood water was carving through was much softer as it had only been recently deposited, producing the immense canyon that is seen. Note that the same process may have begun in the east over the elevated Kebab Plateau and both connected later. As the flood continued to lower, the waters began to flow from north, south, east into the canyon forming an amazing spectacle. The branching pattern that ensued from this is seen on a much smaller scale with receding tide patterns in areas with lots of sand. Examples include the coast of Argentina and the Wadden Sea in the Netherlands. The gullies in the Wadden Sea seem to form in the highest part of the sandbank where erosive force from overlying waters would be the greatest. The large river that eventually formed drained this inland sea and produced the massive valley that the Colorado River now finds itself in. The deeper central channel was formed afterwards by the Colorado River once most of the floodwaters had receded. The same pattern is also seen in the Fish River Canyon in Namibia. The flat plain represents sheet erosion from a wide expanse of water that flowed off the African continent into the Atlantic Ocean. And like the Grand Canyon, there are many side canyons indicating large landlocked lakes draining into the primary canyon. Sedimentary butts are amazing land structures that stand as testimony to an immense flood having occurred within thousands rather than millions of years. Taking into account that the average continental weathering rate occurs at 6 cm per thousand years, that would mean the entire continental shelf would have been denuded within 10 million years. However, these butts remain standing. In fact, vertical cliff faces are even more subject to erosion due to the effects of gravity, landslides and the alternating freeze-thaw effect. Monument Valley demonstrates a number of these unusual land formations. They have the exact same sediment layers indicating that there has been a massive amount of erosion from the land in between them. If this was due to millions of years of weathering, it is inconceivable that these formations are still present as they should have been eroded as well. However, in a flood scenario which occurred over a short period of time, random water flow can leave some areas unaffected while the rest of the land is subject to massive sheet erosion. These are called flood erosional elements. This flood is demonstrably recent as there is very little eroded debris at the bases of these land formations. The erosion from the rest of the land is not seen 
as the receding floodwaters transported a majority of this onto the continental shelf. Some butts are not sediment, but remains of volcanic rock with the surrounding sediment being washed away. The Devil's Tower in Wyoming is an example of this. Once again, however, at current levels of erosion, this igneous rock should demonstrate significant erosion over millions of years. It, however, demonstrates very little erosion, indicating a recent catastrophic flood removing 300 metres of sediment from around it but leaving the relatively resistant volcanic rock. Water gaps are also strong evidence for the receding flood scenario. These are carved gaps through mountain ranges which seem to indicate rivers flowed through a mountain barrier instead of going around it. Their origin is not a mystery if one accepts the receding flood scenario. The water is channeled through the ranges as the flood level reduces carving out these gaps. Examples are numerous throughout all continents. A notable example is the Zagros Mountains in Iran where rivers and streams seem to shun valleys and prefer to transect through mountains. The Delaware water gap in the US is a great example of a river which suddenly turns to transect through a mountain range. Like the Susquehanna River, also in the US, these rivers seem to do the impossible as they cut through mountain ranges. Across the globe in southern Africa, the Great Escarpment was shaped and moulded during the recession part of the flood. As receding fleet erosion flattened the continent, there was regional uplift of continents towards the coastal margins. Receding flood waters ran into the deepening oceans over these domes, creating further erosion to flatten the surface and then downward flow to carve out the Great Escarpment. The eroded sediment formed the coastal plains and then the continental shelves. The Himalayan mountains also demonstrate the telltale signs of receding flood. As mentioned previously, water erosion forms rounded stones both large and small. When small, these are called gravel in geological terminology. The Himalayas were formed as the Eurasian plate collided with the Indo-Australian plate towards the end of the flood. As the sedimentary rock between the two continents was uplifted, an enormous amount of erosion occurred as the waters rushed off these mountains and into the ocean basins. It is therefore not surprising that the Himalayan mountains are bounded on all sides by gravel. This gravel can be several thousand metres thick and consists of a sheet hundreds and thousands of kilometres long, especially along the Siwalik formation south of the Himalayas. If the gravel was formed by rivers, as per traditional geology, then they should have deposited a variety of sediment, from clay to gravel, with rapid changes throughout the rock face. Continual sheet de deposition of small weathered stones of gravel is what one would expect, however, with sheet erosion during the receding stage of the flood. It is also difficult to believe that such high mountain ranges could have occurred slowly over millions of years, as they would have had to have overcome the continual erosive force of rain, wind and gravity, not to mention the freeze-thaw mechanism and chemical erosion. Rapid formation by powerful catastrophic tectonic plate movement overcomes these processes and uplifts the mountain ranges to staggering heights. A global flood also provided the conditions that made the consequent ice age inevitable. The mechanisms that formed widespread glaciers are difficult to elucidate in mainstream geology as slightly lower temperatures by themselves are not enough to do it. Not only does the ice have to survive the summer, there has to be an increased amount of precipitation or snow. It has been estimated that to glaciate northeast Canada, one needs to double the amount of snowfall and reduce the temperatures by up to 10 degrees Celsius. The predicted lower temperatures from the Milankovic astronomical theory are not enough to cause ice age glaciation. The flood, however, provides all the right conditions. Subterranean superheated water and volcanic action heated the world's oceans to above 20 degrees their current temperature. Temperature-related oxygen isotope ratios in the shells of single-celled organisms in the late Cretaceous period of the geological column are evidence for this assumption. As the waters drained off the continent, there would have been mixing of these waters allowing for universally warm oceans from pole to pole. An enormous amount of dust and aerosols created by the increased volcanic activity during catastrophic plate movements provided rapid cooling by reflecting sunlight, especially over the continents.
The warm waters then led to an increased evaporation and this water-laden air rushed towards the cold continents and fell initially as rain. While the rain would have cleared the dust and aerosols, the large amount of cloud cover continued to reflect the sunlight. The combination of warm oceans and cold continents caused major storm tracks to develop, allowing for continual continental precipitation and cooling of the oceans. Eventually, temperatures began to reduce to allow precipitation as snow over mid and high latitudes. Continual snow led to sheet ice formation and glaciers. Within hundreds of years, they became so thick they started flowing under their own weight, creating the telltale physical evidence of glacial debris and glacial striations, which are also seen with current day glaciers. The evidence for multiple glaciations is merely speculative based on circular reasoning and significant assumptions. Multiple advances and retreats of the one ice sheet during the post-flood ice age is sufficient to explain stacked thin teal sheets, i.e. deposits found when ice melts, with some non-glacial deposits found between them. Individual thin ice layers are therefore not indicative of yearly precipitation, as per traditional geology, but separate storms bringing in new snow. Separate storms bringing in intermittently hot air from the warmer oceans also explains changing oxygen isotope levels within the ice. It is estimated that at 500 years post-flood, the ocean temperature had reduced significantly to reduce evaporation sufficiently leading to glacial melting. Once again, the continents were subject to a large amount of water erosion in a short period of time as the ice melted, widening post-flood rivers. As mentioned previously, the Missouri Scablands demonstrate the effects of rapid flooding following release of an ancient lake by melting of the ice that had held it in. For the last 4,000 years, the earth has been recovering from this tectonic watery disaster which wrought havoc upon the planet and shaped all of its major geological features. Tectonic movement still occurs, but only as an echo of its former pace. Small rivers now flow through massive canyons, haughtingly unaware of their catastrophic beginnings. The evidence for the global flood is everywhere, shadowing virtually all of geology. Its effects are clear and obvious for all with eyes to see. However, Earth's population have lost their connection with their creator and therefore have been blinded to the obvious. Indoctrinated by billions of years and slow change, they cannot see what clearly represents a one-off disaster that is not to be repeated. For the next time the Earth is destroyed, it will be with fire. Thank you.